Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. Uh, I'm very pleased to have me, with me today again, Harvey Mansfield, professor of government at Harvard and a uh, frequent participant in Conversations. And um, we'll have many more. Um, Thank you. Discuss the so yeah. many, many topics about which you can instruct us. So I thought we, today we would talk about constitutionalism, something you've written on, a uh, book of your essays is called, I assume that was your choice, America's Constitutional Soul. Yes. And, uh, and we were reminded of, of uh, the Constitution with the recent death of Justice uh, Nino Scalia. Uh, the piece we had in the Weekly Standard on it, uh, it was entitled, one of the pieces, The American Constitutionalist. And I was thinking that I guess you really couldn't, uh, one can't really imagine a piece about uh, a lawyer or a judge from another nation with that kind of, you know, the Consti constitutionalist is somehow yes. very American. It is so, very American. since you wrote the America's Constitutional Soul, yeah. uh, explain. Right. So, <laughs> how do we start? Uh, well, Justice Scalia was one of America's greatest justices. Um, and his uh, associated with a doctrine, uh, originalism, I think, in the way that most uh, Supreme Court judges or justices are not. Uh, also, uh, he wasn't known especially for landmark cases, but especially for his dissents, his uh, stinging or blistering dissents, as <laughs> the terms that were often used. And um, so he was a man of dissent. He wanted to bring the Constitution back and back to its origin. Uh, and that meant bringing it back from its present abuse by the progressives or the Democrats or the liberals or those who understood uh, the purpose of a constitution as to adjust to changing times. <coughs> the name for this in a book was The Living Constitution, a book written a long, long time ago, and I think in 1924 by a progressive uh, scholar, that uh, the constitution should have an organic growth to it instead of, <coughs> a, instead of a, being a, a permanent framework fixed um, so uh, Scalia, Scalia wanted to go back to a permanent and fixed constitution. Now this constitution was made by framers in the 1787, 88, and uh, was when it was passed and ratified. And those framers, I think, Scalia thought to be very wise. And the question arises, how important is wisdom in uh, the constitution, and how important is simply is it simply to take their words seriously? So I think clearly, uh, if they hadn't been wise, uh, he probably would not have been an originalist. Though, uh, so some have accused him of being a positivist, uh, somebody who believed that law consists in making a decision, and and that's all there is to a law. But no, I think uh, that he saw that behind uh, this law, the Constitution is a law. There was um, there was wisdom. So still, um, the idea of wisdom competes with the idea of original because the original might not be wise or you might come upon ways in which the Constitution needed improvement. Um, of course, the uh, Constitution has a provision for that. Right. You, can make, you can amend it. So, uh, but that hasn't often been done. Uh, and so, so that, uh, that suggests, I think, that the Constitution is a um, is a law, and this was uh, Scalia's uh, insistence all the way through. John Marshall had said that, and others had said that, but uh, he wanted to remind, remind his, uh, his opponents, as I think he always had opponents in mind, that uh, the Constitution is a law. It's not a set of policy proposals. It's so that, that means that the Constitution is uh, above ordinary law. It's a law which is above law, and yet it's not a higher law. It's not way up above. <laughs> it's not in the sky or uh, divine, any, anywhere up there. But it, it, it's, uh, it's above ordinary law. And that means that uh, ordinary law, uh, that, that it must not be considered in the same way as an ordinary law. That uh, in ordinary law you would, you would work within the Constitution by uh, following its procedures, uh, but you would find a principle or a policy that you'd want to enact. But um, 
you would enact it constitutionally if you obeyed the due process that in it's in the Constitution. So the Constitution should be, to maintain this distinction between itself and ordinary law, sh it should be um, a uh, n n n not another ordinary law. It should therefore it has to be about process or due process. And yet uh, there is a, a tradition in constitutional interpretation, constitutional history, called substantive due process. That's a kind of oxymoron mm -hmm. because <laughs> due process means uh, you, d you do it the right way and therefore it isn't substantive. As long as the substance is all right as long as you do it the right way. But uh, there was this tradition and it had been maybe perhaps started by Republicans mm -hmm. wishing to put uh, the principles of the free market or or uh, economics into uh, the Constitution, and then then followed, picked up by uh, the Supreme Court in the Roosevelt era, and coming to a head culmination in uh, the under the Chief Justiceship of Earl Warren, and uh, where uh, so so the uh, in in the course of the history of the Constitution and especially the recent history, the 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 distinction between constitutional and ordinary law has been eroded or even erased. So Scalia brought that back to mind and he made constitutionalism or const the Constitution a political force by doing so. Uh, that, that I think is his uh, importance. Now uh, there were the principle behind uh, the, uh, uh, the Constitution uh, then is that it's uh, um, based on um, or, or, or it prescribes due process so that it should only be um, a process and that process uh, implies a, a good deal of uh, partisanship in an interesting and, and strange way different from other countries uh, in Federalist uh, 51 occurs the famous phrase let counter uh, uh, let ambition counteract ambition so the Constitution is very friendly to ambition. It doesn't expect the three branches to cooperate, but it sets, us, sets up a separation of powers, which is a kind of contest for supremacy. And uh, each of the branches has its claims and its powers and uh, makes a contribution, but the contribution is not uh, a harmonious contribution which fits together easily with the others. So the Constitution, therefore, is always in dispute. If you think of it as a way to settle disputes, that might be right, but the disputes are not settled by the Constitution itself because uh, it, uh, they, the uh, powers are going to be interpreted each, by, each separately by itself. So Congress has its view of itself and the executive and, this, and the courts. So they each have a characteristic view uh, that goes with uh, being an executive, which means you're managing or running something, or being a legislator, which means you're putting people together, meeting with them, listening to lobbyists and consist constituents, trying to find out what the people want and what they ought to want. Or you're a court, you're on a court, you're a judge, you're sitting uh, in your office or on the bench, uh, comparing uh, the result of this legislative process, a law, with, uh, w with the Constitution and trying to understand it, apply it uh, in uh, particular cases. So, so these, those are three very different jobs. And the Constitution, as you could say, takes advantage of those, uh, of those differences. And, <coughs> and Madison in, in Federalist 51 makes an interesting remark after he says, let ambition counteract ambition. He says, the interest of the man must be connected to the powers of the office. So your interest develops, uh, if you're, say, a senator, develops out of your membership in the Senate. And uh, that means uh, that you will look at things uh, from the standpoint of a senator, and you're uh, encouraged to do this uh, because uh, any action that you take would have to be the action of a of a senator. You can't. You don't have access to <laughs> a court or 
or to the, an executive office. So you are what you are. And that means, therefore, that if you want to promote yourself, your ambition, make something big out of yourself, uh, you've got to do it th in your way through the office that you hold, or maybe through the office that you want to hold, because ambition uh, <laughs> occurs in people that don't hold the office but want to. So, uh, so here, here we've got this ambition, uh, which is uh, channeled or directed by the different three different branches, and and uh, and, and they so they they fight, they contest, they vie for uh, a result, wh which uh, is uh, sort of regulated by the Constitution, but not but not decided by it. So the Constitution doesn't say, uh, exactly say wha what the Second Amendment mi means, or, or that, that uh, can be, uh, that, that, that's decided by um, a, a contest that is ultimately the, uh, at the will of the people. So you've, you're, uh, who gets elected and so on uh, is, is, is sort of the, the final say. There's a lot of process that goes on, but still it comes to an end when the people decide, say, that Congress is right on this or the President is right on this. And, and, and then, of course, that doesn't necessarily remain uncontested. And uh, later elections can come to different results and put in office different people. So that, that is this picture of, uh, of a, a very contestable Constitution in which a lot of people are making confident remarks about the Constitution, what it says and requires and demands, um, which are often or usually interpretations of ambiguous statements or st generalities that could go one way or another. And there are certain ways, certain interesting differences, say, the powers of Congress are enumerated and, uh, but then at the bottom of the enumeration is the so-called necessary and proper clause, clause, which says that all the enumerated powers uh, uh, are added to, must be supplemented by uh, anything, any po the power what, uh, to do whatever is necessary and proper to enforce them. So that sort of adds a little steam to the enumerated powers. Whereas the executive uh, isn't enumerated. That's a kind of interesting difference. That, uh, there's no limit set to the executive power, except that it's called the executive office. The president uh, doesn't uh, uh, s swears to uphold the right. executive office and his duties as president, only one of which is to faithfully execute the laws. He's al also commander in chief and he has a veto right over legislation. So uh, th the, the Constitution does affect the way in which this battle or contention is, is, is carried on but it's, um, it, 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 it doesn't decide. So uh, and I, th I think it's important to realize this, that the, that the Constitution is not, um, it's not a way to come to decisions, but it's, it's a process by which, um, I mean, it is, it is a way to come to decisions, but not to decide. It doesn't decide for you. You have to use it. The people still get to Govern themselves. I mean, the Constitution doesn't. The people having established yes. the Constitution, the Constitution is sort yes. of above the people, but it also doesn't. Yeah. But it allows the people to govern themselves, right? So it's it's both democratic and a little more yes. than democratic. I mean, how does yeah. The Constitution does, uh, begins "We the people," and uh, it, it's strange. In other words, uh, "We the people" is the origin of the Constitution, right. and and yet, uh, having passed the Constitution, the people end up as uh, subjects, citizens, yes, but subjects to the decisions of the, of the government that they're under. So they're both above the government, or both above the Constitution and underneath it. Uh, they're above it because they can always change it and because they get things started, but they're underneath it because the purpose of the Constitution is, is to govern them. Self-government is still a form of government. So, right. so, and, um, so uh, uh, both on both on top and right at the bottom. That's kind of interesting feature of of um, of constitutionalism. Now um, the constitution is uh, has a strange relationship to parties. 
if you look at uh, the Federalist on Parties, number, number 10 Federalist discusses um, factions which are pretty much identified with parties in the, in the Federalist. The framers uh, look down on factions and, uh, and at the same time on parties. I, d I don't think they didn't want to make a distinction between right. faction and party because I think they didn't want to, to encourage faction. But a faction is a group that acts contrary to uh, the individual rights of others or to the aggregate interest of the community. <coughs> and that opens up the possibility that there could be a, a group that favors or supports, promotes uh, the, the rights of individuals and the interest of the community. Uh, like the, say, framers themselves or the authors of the Federalist, or, or generally speaking, the Federalists. Um, but the Federalists uh, didn't identify themselves or want to be identified as a party. They were identified only by uh, their enemies, right. <laughs> their right. opponents, uh, who um, was um, especially Je Thomas Jefferson, who was in George Washington's first cabinet, but then uh, left and started to work against uh, George Washington and against especially Alexander Hamilton and the people that were called Federalists and, wh and whom uh, uh, who, um, yeah, Thomas Jefferson called monocrats. He thought that these people were uh, bringing the government back to the evils of monarchy. And so he wanted to promote a true republicanism. And that was uh, uh, his party, the so Democratic Republican Party. They wanted to make the American Republic more democratic, and that is on closer to true republicanism. And that also meant closer to the people. Right. <coughs> so, and this party succeeded in making what it called, and is generally allowed to be a, a revolution, a political revolution, in the election of uh, 1800, when Jefferson came in. And this was the first regular sort of public respectable um, party that called itself a party and then that at that time and that one. now what it, what it did was uh, it tried to bring uh, um, the p uh, government closer to the people Th <coughs> that I think is quite contrary to uh, what the Federalists attempted to do the Federalists had attempted to put a distance between the government and the people they thought that republics throughout history had failed when they, become, when they became too democratic. And so in Federalist 10, this is James Madison, later a Republican mm -hmm. and a member of Jefferson's party, who makes a, distinguish, a, a distinction between democracy, that's bad, and republic, that's good. By democracy, he means something like pure democracy, like Athenian democracy, when uh, there was no representation, but uh, if you were a citizen, you were automatically a member of the assembly. And, uh, and, and, and such assemblies were sort of open to manipulation, to demagoguery, and to uh, error, and impulse, passion, and finally, to uh, demagogue who might become tyrant. So this is how republics died, by becoming too democratic. And the Federalists picked this up, and they thought that uh, this, this danger, that the danger of democracy, was not something obsolete. It was not something that had been cured uh, just by no longer living in mm -hmm. a city-state of Greece, uh, but now it was still powerful in America. And uh, they, so they, they wanted to make sure that um, government was at a distance from the people. And to do this, they had to enable the government. And, um, and to explain this, they uh, used two words in a political context which hadn't been used before. Two, two, which are used, two invented new words in... Um, in the Federalist. Well, one is responsibility, 
And that word had been used before, but in a different sense, just as it w- had been used to mean responsiveness. So you ask me a question and I answer it. Okay. That's responsive. But responsibility, in, 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 in the way we now use it, was used for the first time in the Federalist to mean sort of taking charge of a situation that's uh, in difficulty uh, and, uh, and, and, and danger and doing something about it. <coughs> doing something about it on behalf of the people who aren't there to do anything themselves. Mm-hmm. So you, you act responsibly when you, when you take care of something you know, by yourself, because perhaps the, the people who are normally supposed to take care of it aren't there or aren't able. So that, that's this new meaning of responsibility, take charge meaning. And, and the other um, new word was energy. This is a word from physics, from Newtonian physics, and energy of a, of, a, of a particle that moves or of a mo- or motion of a thing. Uh, and that was now used to mean p- politics. And so that word was born, which we now hear all the time, energetic. Right. So Jeb Bush, low energy, <laughs> so is, as Mr. Trump said. So, but, so that's present day use, and it begins here. There was another kind of, um, of uh, power, and that was stability, the opposite of energy. So, uh, if you're, you're the, in other words, the government is supposed to have energy and is supposed to have stability. These two opposite things. Um, so, so that both of those are possible only for a, a government that it, that is, has some distance from the people, because the people altogether can either be torpid, quiet, and passive, and do nothing, or they can be volatile right. and, and passionate. So. For the, in the first case, they lack energy. In the second, they lack stability. So, st- so all these, these, these qualities all depend on keeping government at a, at a distance from the people. And this is what Jefferson uh, <laughs> tried to <laughs> overcome or erode. I mean, not that Jefferson himself didn't take, um, uh, you might say, uh, responsible, energetic right. decisions. The purchase of Louisiana is a great example. So uh, no, he didn't de- altogether leave the Constitution behind, but this principle, uh, perhaps he left. He made it harder for him to do what he did by buying Le- Louisiana with the principles of his party. Right. So he sort of created his own difficulty there, or at least uh, worsened it. Um, and and then and and ever since uh, this, uh, ever since the Federalist Party. American politics has uh, become more and more democratic. And in Tocqueville's famous uh, book, which is, uh, this is in the 1830s, uh, it was at the time of Andrew Jackson's presidency, a very democratic man. Uh, and, and, uh, and Tocqueville took the, his, his cue or his understanding of America as he saw it from the presidency of Jackson. And he said that uh, the representative forms and institutions of the framers had been overcome, overwhelmed by, by democracy, and, and that those representation, the whole notion of keeping government at a, at a distance uh, was no longer the case, no longer the truth uh, of American democracy, that the people would always get what they wanted, and it was their power that uh, one could always see uh, triumphant. So, uh, so, so, so this is yeah. Now, right now we come to uh, so in other words, so we, the the parties, um, the pol- political parties that we have now, uh, become powerful. But still, those parties work through the constitution. It's in, in its um, um, different branches, in its devotion to due process, and then and I, so if. If if you're a, a senator, y- your your interest and your principle is to maintain the importance of the Senate. But when the parties come on the scene, this uh, party character of each of the three branches is affected by the other of the political parties, uh, because uh, you're, you you tend to want to promote the power of the branch that 
you hold and to demote the power of the branches you don't hold. So if you're a, a Democratic Party and the president is a Republican, you accuse him of being imperialistic and, and ex exaggerating the powers and, and, and tyrannical. You don't hear that word very much anymore, but, but uh, encroaching and so on. Um, and, and vice versa if uh, it's a Democratic president and a, and a Republican Congress. So uh, the, the two layers are, are, are um, set, set of, of partisanship right. are set over against each other or, that, or don't uh, uh, completely match. And, um, and, 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 what is, and, and if you act in a principled manner according to your party, <laughs> then <coughs> you're uh, acting in an unprincipled manner according to the branch of government that you happen to be work in or right. pulled office in. So, uh, and so that this, uh, this way we have, this n sort of nonpartisan way of, uh, of, of referring to people as principled, saying, yes, I don't agree with him, but he's a man of principle or a person of principle. And he, um, so, and, uh, and, and that's a way of making uh, disagreement tolerable and respectable. That doesn't, it doesn't work so easily when uh, the Constitution, has, which has its own partisanship, uh, is uh, inhabited by political parties, uh, each of which um, works within the Constitution. But you could say as a whole that the, part of that the Constitution makes use of our partisanship. And right. Therefore, it, it, um, it understands and uh, gives allowance for the partisan character of human beings <laughs> and their, the fact that they have, that your reason is directed or connected to your self-love. This is Madison again. Uh, and, uh, and that you're, you have passions, you, uh, that, uh, that you connect to your, uh, you give reasons to. And so your reason is passionate, and your, but your pa passions have some rationality to them. And, that, and that's, um, and, and that is, a, I think, a very good feature of, uh, of our Constitution. Now, if you look at the parties today... Well, let me ask you, can I ask you before you get to the parties today? Is yeah. So, so on the... I mean, Scalia, it seems to me, defended originalism, sometimes at least, as uh, curbing unelected judges, you know, doing whatever they wanted yeah. in interpreting the Constitution because uh, judges should follow the actual text and meaning of the Constitution, and that left it open to the public, to the people, to the democratic branches to decide if they wanted to change the status of marriage or whatever these other yeah. issues are. So originalism was in the service, as Scalia presents, and he presents it this way a lot, I think, of democracy. Yes. But you're also saying that originalism in a certain way tries to go back to a constitution that was less, quote, democratic or, or less yes. populist because it elevates the constitution in a sense above the public, so are both right. is, is, is yeah. yes. uh, are those both right, or yes. are they in, right? Well, there's a tension uh, there. I mean, yeah. well, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yes, uh, yeah. But you, uh, one way to keep your distance is not to decide on behalf of the people, with, without giving them a chance to to vote on, and to make sure they go through regular yes. forms yes. and That's processes. The process of the constitution is elections. And, 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 and it's not part of the due, pro due process that, uh, that the Supreme Court becomes a legislature. Right. And so, uh, you know, that was what he frequently says. You know, but this is in the service of the people. Well, the, f the framers also intended to, right. be, to, to work in, in the service of the people and that therefore they were more democratic. But, yeah, yeah it's true. You could say Scalia's arguments are... are uh, con S more suitable to today and to a democratized constitution. So he's pointing out that uh, that the Supreme Court is 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 usurping the right of the people and and um, get in that way getting getting too close to the people, but doing I think what they had doing what they do uh, instead of them. On the other hand, the respect for Scalia that was um, obviously shown at his death by so many people, in the sense that he had done something important in restoring originalism. I think points to the other side of the Constitution that you've discussed. I mean, the, the, that it's something above mere process or yes. ground rules. I mean, that he's uh -huh. a man who sort of 
respected something that yes. and taught us to respect something that should be respected yeah. and was important to the country for that reason. Yes, constitution has uh, two meanings. There's the uh, Greek word uh, that, that was used by Aristotle to mean regime. Politeia was a Greek word. Regime or constitution in the sense of, in a kind of biological sense of structure and in which, uh, in the sense in which every political unit has a constitution, has a certain way of going about and living in a certain way that it promotes. Um, and and um, it's, it's, it, 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 it's the structure which includes the structure of the society that it wants to govern. In that case, uh, in that meaning, every uh, political unit has a, every state has a constitution. But the other meaning is, uh, say, the meaning of our constitution, that um, it's limited government. Yeah. So, uh, and it's a written constitution, and it says what you can do and what you cannot do, and it sets up a distinction between state and society, and it's a state and a way of life, and our constitution try, li tries to leave the way of life up to the public or to the uh, private choice and free choice of those uh, who um, are subject to the laws, but the laws are meant to still endow you with uh, a choice of your way of living. Uh, and somehow we're in between or we combine these two uh, opposite uh, meanings of constitution because uh, our constitution may, uh, yeah, see, with if you say constitution means limited government, then it com uh, certain states are unconstitutional and certain um, actions are unconstitutional. Right. And it's not the case that every state has a constitution. Some don't, or some have fake constitutions. But uh, still, uh, th this is a kind of paradox of liberalism then, of the kind of um, free society that we live in and live under, which is that uh, on, on the one hand, uh, you need a strong state to provide security, both uh, externally against enemies and internally against invasions of, of rights, um, but still leaving the way you live up to your choice, and the fact that uh, a free constitution isn't going to survive uh, a people that isn't free, that doesn't know how to live freely, or that lacks the, what Tocqueville called the art of being free. That is, you have to use your liberty with a certain moderation. Sen you have to be sensible, and you have to um, um, not, not be lazy or tumultuous or insistent. You have to be tolerant, but you also have to act. You can't just sit back and let things happen. Right. So, uh, in, in other words, you have to have a certain character. So, so even a free country has a character to it, and, that, and that's a kind of par a paradox because it means that it isn't perfectly free, or it isn't free to be perfectly free. It isn't free to be free against the interests of its own freedom. And I think the admiration for Scalia, don't you think, had to do with his character, actually, in yes. the sense that as a judge, but really more broadly as a public figure or public servant, as we say, he, you know, yeah. he was courageous. He didn't buckle to the tides. He was proud of his right. sole descent in uh, what was Morrison v. Olson. I guess that was the case I think he was most proud of, which was the independent counsel case. And uh -huh. he was alone, and then he was vindicated. I, I, I think we people underestimate that side of why one admires someone like Scalia, the kind of... Uh, why well, Democrats can admire him. Right. They do. Yeah. And why it's and non lawyers yeah. and non judges and yes. just citizens, you know, is sort of yeah. a model for other yeah. for legislators and executives to some degree too. Yeah. So he's a great figure, but he's not just a great Republican or a great conservative jurist. He was a right. he was a great man. And um, yes, an example for us all. Which the Constitution allows uh, Yes, uh, the Constitution allows and encourages and yeah. So which is impressive in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you were saying so about and so the parties. Meanwhile, yes, uh, uh, <laughs> the the parties today are divided. Uh, you know, uh, between the um, in their attitude towards the Constitution, 
you know, the, the Democrats uh, use the Constitution when it helps them and 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 uh, chafe against it right. or, or try to evade it uh, when it doesn't. So they they are lacking in respect for the Constitution, and, and that's because they consider it something fixed, and which uh, is hostile to their um, notion of progress. Right. Their notion of progress uh, means uh, progress in equality, more and more equality we must have. So different uh, programs to promote equality, and these all, all these programs require government action, and when you add them all up, you have the thing called big government, we have already which uh, you can find in Talk Fools Democracy in America, 1840 that came out, or that part of it came out, and, 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 and we've seen the result of his uh, prediction today. So if you're in favor of big government, it's hard to be in favor of a constitution that um, is well, it's <laughs> a, a solely devoted to process. Right. And, you, and you're tempted to use the constitution to accomplish the, the, uh, your, the goals of your program and, and uh, w what could have been otherwise a, an ordinary law. Well, and the big, uh, big examples would be the, the abortion case and the more recently the same-sex marriage case. Both of those are, it's a usurpations of the people's right to choose through Congress. And, and um, b both of them have been uh, fairly controversial, the abortion one especially. And people thought that uh, sending the abortion issue to the court would, would resolve the problem and calm people down and give them a decision that uh, everyone could live with. And the reverse has happened, right. partly because it was such, a, uh, such an extreme um, case or such an extreme decision that the, that the court took. So, um, so, so the Democrats, f for the most part, uh, are, are not, d you can't be accused of being constitutionally scrupulous or over-scrupulous. So, so the Republicans on their side are, are, are more respectful of the Constitution and indeed have made it uh, one of their party purposes or principles mm. to return to the Constitution. And this can be done uh, in both in a, in a more sensible and or more uh, questionable way. As a, a Tea Party, for example, w wants to find its every everything that it and anything that it dislikes that <coughs> it opposes by saying it's not in the Constitution. So, uh, as if uh, and, and if it, everything that it likes then would have to be in the Constitution. So that's a way of turning the Constitution again into an ordinary law, uh, and, and instead of standing above ordinary law. So you you can do that in a, in this questionable way, but still the Republicans uh, have also more sensibly. Uh, uh, D demanded a return and, uh, to the principles of the founders, and um, and and they speak of the Constitution much more frequently than uh, and with much more much greater admiration than uh, than the Democrats do. Uh, <coughs> and this is this is, uh, I suppose, good if you're a constitutionalist, uh, but it can sometimes hamper the Republicans, as we saw in the cases on the uh, Affordable Care Act, and, and there. Um, Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, um, it looked as if he said to himself that it's not the business of the Supreme Court to do the work of the Republican Party. Right. And, 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 and that, I think, is a, a, a very constitutionalist way of, of looking at the problem. So he refused to, to, uh, to gut or to severely damage the, the uh, Obamacare Act and, um, and, and, and took, a, took a step that I, I think he regarded as, and, and I think could, could well be regarded as, um, as, a, as a constitutional one in, on behalf of the uh, voters. Let them decide. If they want uh, to repeal Obamacare, we, we shouldn't do it. They should do it. And uh, so that, that is a, you could say, Scalia mm -hmm. in, a, in a different guise. Yeah. Uh, trying to keep the court independence from politics, which means uh, from the politics of elections. 
it has its own politics, but, but uh, and its politics uh, is, is what it is devoted to and what its legitimacy rests on, sort of a, a legal politics, and, uh, and that's that's one thing. But um, ju just to make it, uh, um, an, you know, a, a, co a corrector of Congress, that's uh, that's a usurpation. And all this, these now almost what a century and a half, two centuries maybe, if you go back to Jefferson, of progress and progressivism and egalitarianism and democracy, but we still have a constitutional soul. Is that your, <laughs> your, your uh, argument or assertion, or at least one of our two parties has a constitutional soul? I mean, how much does the Constitution still shape our politics? I guess is, is, would be my question. Or is that a yeah? Well, a very great deal, I would say, uh -huh. even, even though we may not uh, equally, a, at any rate in both parties, uh, pay homage to it. Uh, it it's um, it's a, s a source of our public spiritedness, it, it, um, it, and the ground of our public spiritedness. It's uh, that public spirit in our country r refers to our self-government and the Constitution is our the document by which our self our government governs itself, or by our people governs itself, and and I th and I think that's that's what makes it uh, the soul. It has it's both active and reflexive, active um, because it makes people act on it on their behalf uh, through constitutionally provided institutions or con constitutionally permitted institutions, the parties. Um, and uh, so you can act uh, because you have these rules of process which enable you to act and, and to act regularly and with some notion of how to proceed and it's not chaotic. Um, and, and at the same time, it's reflexive because the Constitution mean is, is, is above ordinary politics. And it encourages people, partisan as they are, to think of the country's good, which is, uh, you know, which can is embodied in the in the Constitution. That's uh, you could say our the Constitution is our most precious common possession. And 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 uh, in in thinking in this way, you you rise above yourself, your self-interest to your self-government. You realize that you're governing yourself, and, and that's a, re a reflexive thought as well as an active uh, motive. And, and, and that gives uh, a, a certain intellectual satisfaction and, and the grounding, rational grounding, for a politics which is full of unreason and passion and, and um, disagreement and disappointment and only occasional satisfaction or, right. or triumph. Yes, that's <laughs> yeah. true. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, I, th I think the, the yeah. soul of our Constitution is this, um, is this public spiritedness that, that Americans have. Now, and they don't all have it uh, equally. Is that, is that it's sometimes put up against us, against American democracy, that we don't vote. Uh, um, in the same percentage as uh, as other places, and why don't we force everybody to vote, right. or why don't we get everybody to vote with incentives, pay them to vote? This was <laughs> you can find that in Aristotle. Well, now I th I think I'm. And this may sound funny, but I, I'm going to say that um, I think it's the wisdom of uh, of non-voters that that keeps them from. Uh, uh, keeps them from voting. It's, it, it, it's their modesty. Uh, if if you're not interested, and if you haven't taken the trouble to yeah, why? to inform yourself, you know why should you bother to do something which has no meaning for yourself, and uh, and and which only sort of gets in the way of those who do vote meaningfully. So I I, I I'm I rather glad it. At this, and I think there is an infor informal distinction, but seen between the citizens with public spirited and, and those, and those who are not so public spirited, but uh, rather like it that others uh, 
do what they don't need to do or don't want to do. No. So, when I, so that uh, because there's such a thing as too much public spiritedness, uh -huh. and uh, that you can see that uh, in certain ambitious types, but also uh, at, in revolutionary times when everything is up for decision and and nothing is regular or understandable. I want to come back to this question of the Constitution being process, but somehow also more than process. Mm -hmm. It is process, and but it, it's more than a Robert's Rules of Order for yes. you know, how the branches should yeah. behave. And um, you can see that, obviously, in the well, Madison says, I guess it's Federalist 49, uh, asks, expects, or anticipates, or hopes for that there'll be reverence for the Constitution. So, I mean, again, yeah. just the ambiguity of the Constitution being merely law or merely process on the one hand yeah. and somehow the founding document. Yes. I, mean, I think that would be... Right. Uh, a founding document that we all respect and ad admire. Look up and to. And revere, yes. Revere. And it's difficult to yeah, change. Difficult to change and, and we don't want to change it. Right. And we, we like it. Um, so, yeah, the Constitution is... Um, is our uh, our form of government. Now, uh, how is it related to the Declaration of Independence, one could ask. It's, um, the Declaration of Independence doesn't mention any form of government. It, it just says that the people have a right to alter and abolish the, the government they live under and to form up one uh, that, they, uh, that they prefer. And it's clearly a republic that uh, they they have in mind uh, the the signers of the declaration, but uh, they don't uh, attack uh, England because it's a monarchy. Right. They attack it because uh, it is uh, the English king and the English parliament have uh, have uh, acted against the interests and rights of uh, uh, of Americans, and so and so and, and what they declare is independence from England. So it's it, it leaves it quite open, or at least. Um, Apparently open to uh, to uh, what uh, wha what the Constitution then specifies or or provides as a form of government. So and and the question is then whether this form of government is is merely a form uh, and a, and therefore a process, or whether uh, it's something more. <coughs> it's uh, the Constitution is sometimes likened to the rules of a game. But it's the rules of a game wh which you're supposed to play. <laughs> right. So you're supposed to play the game of self-government, and that's <laughs> that is what the Declaration says. So how you play that then then becomes extremely important, and because you may have to play it in a certain way, so that uh, your 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 freedom and your equality uh, are uh, are combined and um, and 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 supported. Uh, in a lasting and effective way. So, um, the uh, so, so what about equality? See, Lincoln said that um, <coughs> the uh, Declaration imp uh, 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 sort of gives the principle or inspiration, and the and the, and the Constitution gives the uh, specification. And so he likened this, I think, with a phrase out of the Bible to uh, the apple of gold, right. that's the declaration, and the frame of silver, as, as, uh, as in the Constitution. The Constitution was the way of making actual the um, promise of the declaration, or the statement of the declaration, that all men are created equal. And uh, th now, uh, that he, ha he said that with a, with a view to slavery, and uh, the um, situation in his time. I, I think uh, that his uh, his speech uh, in that regard is um, is specific to his time and to the uh, abolition or the overcoming of slavery and its consequences, because there's uh, there's the uh, there's the other difficulty too, which is that uh, 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 that r relevant inequalities will be overlooked. In this, in this, uh, by concentrating solely on this uh, uh, de declara declaration principle that all men are created equal, and and making that sort of the the the, the purpose or the inspiration of all your your um, 
your policies and and and, and, and um, so so I I, th I think that um, uh, it, it goes too far uh, to sort of absolutize Lincoln's situation uh, and and suppose that uh, the making of equality is the only uh, th thing needed and that therefore the inspiration of the Declaration is is more important than the than the uh, instantiation of it in the in the uh, Constitution and the Constitution becomes important when you see that uh, liberty and equality have to be uh, have to be combined and that they are in many ways contrary so y you can uh, right. make equality your sole goal when equality means uh, liberation from slavery but uh, when afterwards or when otherwise you have to consider all the relevant human inequalities uh, how does one make them democratic how does democracy come to grips uh, with the uh, fact of human nature that we're all diverse you know today when people say diverse or diversity they 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 are thinking of diversity without differences well, <laughs> but uh, diversity means differences, and differences means a little bit more or a little bit less of a quality someone else has. So that's inequality. And diversity, therefore, is inequality, and and it's it's a problem for uh, in a, a democracy, and it's and, and, and to uh, m to put together diversity, which is, means liberty, and um, equal equality. And equal opportunity is a way that people sometimes have, and I think it's in general a very good way of, um, of reconciling the two, as long as you understand it's equal opportunity to become unequal. And this is what the Constitution provides. I mean, it, it, there, whereas the Declaration only gives you that first fundamental equality, uh, that is e equality in consenting to government uh, as a whole. And even so, that's done through well, in the case of the written constitution, a ratification process that was um, that was uh, difficult and had a uh, rather restricted electorate, to put it mildly. Right. And so, so, yes, so in 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 practice, in practice, equality becomes inequality, and uh, but inequality that has to be reconciled with its beginning principle. You have to show somehow that. Um, the the e the equality you want uh, allows for the inequalities that you can't avoid, and which, on second thought, you also want. And I guess Lincoln, of course, earlier in his career, did call for reverence for the Constitution and yes. uh, the famous Lyceum speech right. and the That's rule right. of law. So That's right. maybe yeah, the very much so, yeah. And so yeah, he was all all the way through uh, and he, he as president he even he as president or before president. The whole principle of the Republican Party, uh, as yeah. he founded it, was right. to, to be opposed to the abolitionists. Yeah, that's right. They simply wanted equality. They wanted to abolish slavery n by any means uh, possible or any means necessary, and they so they would they would uh, defy, uh, deny the constitutional rights of of the South. And that, and, and it wasn't until the South itself departed from the Constitution by refusing to accept the decision in the election of 1860, which was a fair election, yeah. uh, that uh, Lincoln won um, with only 40 percent of the vote, still uh, a, a majority of the Electoral College. In other words, he won a, a legitimate Constitution. constitutional election, and then the the South seceded, and Lincoln said that it, that is rebellion. So he presented the whole question of slavery, and um, and, and therefore of equality, uh, under the uh, under the aegis of the Constitution of the Union. It was the, the Union Army, say, not the anti-slave army, and so th it was it was because the South was against was uh, trying to destroy the Union that uh, that the Civil War was fought. And Dred Scott was a 
according to the Republicans, a misinterpretation of the Constitution. That's right. Simply yes. contrary. That's right. And contrary to the Declaration, perhaps. But yeah. But but, but that's first, good. Yes. Mm -hmm. First of all, I guess a, yeah. a bad constitutional interpretation. They uh, they argued, and yeah. probably correctly. I'm sure yeah. correctly. Um, yeah, I've always wondered about the frame of silver around the apple of gold. Because it does seem to under value the importance of the Constitution. I suppose Lincoln at that time is arguing against people who forget about, want to forget about the Declaration and make the Constitution just a process, so to speak. Yes. Popular sovereignty and, and right. he had to yeah. elevate elevate the principle of equality. Yes, it in might that be moment. And, and, and anyway that phrase is appears in a fragment of his. It wasn't in a speech. That's a good point. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe it isn't it is maybe it's something he might have had second thoughts about. But anyway, it's such a beautiful thought. Right. From the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's a very good point. So it's more than just a frame. I think that's the yeah. I mean, the Constitution. That's right, it is. More when we say framers, I guess right. I haven't really thought about this before. We don't think, of course, of framers like yeah. picture framers, right? No. <laughs> I don't quite know where the metaphor comes from. We're framers yeah. of right. builders, right? I mean, framework. Yeah. yeah. Framers of frame framework. Mm. Right. So you might have a plan or a yeah. principle that yeah. the building should look this way rather than that. But yeah. the actual framework for building the building is pretty central. I should say. <laughs> so thus, thus America's constitutional soul. Yes, right. Good. Thanks. Nice. Harvey, thank you so much for yeah. joining me today. This is it's a very, pleasure. Very interesting. Always a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.